my dear surgical tech students, welcome to Thoracic Park. I'm Mark Sowers, and this is your Thoracic Surgery Preview. Now, I've got to admit something here. I love cardio and thoracic physiology. I love the functioning and how all this stuff works. It's really, really cool. And I could talk about it for hours and I'm going to try my best not to bore you too much with it, but I am going to talk about it a little bit more just because it gets me so excited. I just love this stuff. So because of that, most books put cardio and thoracic in the same chapter. I've decided to break the two down into two separate chapters only because I'm going to talk a whole lot about it. If it bothers you, you can put this video on fast forward and play it at you know 1.25 times speed and you can hear me buzz through all this detail. So let's start by taking a look at some of the thoracic terms that you might hear. Pulmonary infiltrate. Now, in this case, pulmonary means lungs, so you're going to hear that a lot, okay? So pulmonary means lungs, and infiltrate means something's gotten into where it doesn't belong. Now, take a look at this chest x-ray here. We can see the two lungs on each side, and look at this area in the middle of the right lung. Look how it's kind of cloudy. It's got this sort of splotchiness to it. That's pulmonary infiltrate. That's something that's in that lung that doesn't belong there. Maybe a pneumonia or an infection of some sort, maybe tuberculosis. So this is stuff that's clogging up that lung. It's not supposed to be there. That's pulmonary infiltrate. Hemoptysis. Now this is coughing up blood. This is blood that originates from the lungs or from the bronchi, and you're coughing it up through the trachea and out through the mouth. Hemoptysis. And there are several conditions that can cause this. Cancers, tuberculosis, a lot of other things can cause hemoptysis. So let's take a look at some of the anatomy involving breathing, because that's what this chapter is about. And we'll start up in the head, because that's where the air enters and exits the body. And we've talked about this before in the previous ENT chapter, but we'll review a few items here. When you normally breathe, the air is going to come in through the nose, down through the throat or the pharynx, and then into the front tube, which is the trachea. But when you eat, you have the epiglottis, which is a fold of tissue that closes, that covers over the trachea and allows the food to go down to the back tube, which is the esophagus. So the epiglottis stands upward when you're breathing and it folds downward to cover the trachea when you're eating. But at the other end, you have the uvula. You know, that little thing in the back of your throat that sort of hangs down? That folds back to cover your nasal passage, to cover the nasopharynx, to separate that from the rest of the throat so that when you're eating, you don't get stuff to go back up into the nasal cavity. So the uvula acts very similar to the epiglottis. They both close off their sections of the airway in order to allow food to pass through. Right at the top of the trachea, we find the larynx, which is the voice box. And inside the larynx, right just below the epiglottis, we have the vocal cords, which are little pieces of membrane that can stretch and open and close. And as they do, just like strings on a violin or strings on a guitar, you can change the pitch as they vibrate. So you breathe through these vocal cords and they're going to vibrate. They're going to make a buzzing sound at different pitches, depending on how much they're stretched. But if we left it at just that, if that's all the sound making mechanisms that we had was just this voice box, all we would have is a little buzzing sound because that's all it does. It makes this little buzzing sound, sometimes higher pitch buzzing sounds, sometimes lower pitch buzzing sounds, but that's all it is. It's a buzzing sound that it makes. The way the words are formed, the way all the sounds that are in your voice are formed by all the other structures in the head. Anything from the tongue, of course, you're moving your tongue around, you're moving your lips and your teeth around as you're making words, you're moving your uvula up and down as you talk, and that changes the way words sound. So the sound from that vibrating vocal cord is then changed and modified all the way through the mouth and out, and that's what creates all the sounds that you hear as we speak. The lungs themselves are actually divided into lobes. There, there's a fissure, a break between each of these lobes. They're like completely separate sections of the lung. Now, the left lung has two lobes. The right lung actually has three lobes. Now, the left lung is actually a little bit smaller than the right lung, and that's because the heart is sort of on the left side of the body and takes up some of that space. So you only have two lobes in the left lung, whereas you have three lobes in the right lung. 
just like with the kidney, we had that little indentation where the ureter and the blood vessels came in and out of it. We have the same thing in a lung. We have a little indentation on each lung, and this indentation is known as the hilum. And this is where the bronchus goes in and out of the lungs, and this is where the pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins go in and out. So this area, this little indentation where all this stuff comes in and goes out of the lungs, this is called the hilum. Now, normal lung tissue usually has this very light pink color towards it. It varies a little bit, but generally it's sort of a, a light pink color. And the lung tissue itself is very soft and very friable. Now, friable is an important term and an important concept to understand. What friable means is that it's, it's not very tough. There's not a lot of fibers in there to hold it together. So if you grab a piece of it, you can just very easily pull it apart. It falls apart very easily if you tug on even a, just a little bit. So when we're dealing with lung tissue, and the liver is the same way, when we're dealing with lung tissue, we have to be very gentle with it because it's very friable. It pulls apart very easily. And suturing the lung tissue is going to be difficult because you put a suture in it, it's just going to pull right through that tissue. So usually we don't suture lung tissue. So whenever we do handle lung tissue, we're going to use something that has a nice wide blade on it. And here we have the Lovelace forcep, which has this nice wide blade on it, and it spreads out any pressure that we're going to put on that tissue. Now, the reason the lungs are so friable is because they're actually full of air pockets, full of these little bubbles known as alveoli. Now, this picture shows a lot of these little alveoli all around there, but in reality, there's many, many more of them, and they're much, much smaller than what's shown in this picture. They're really, really tiny little bubbles, little air pockets that hold that air. And to give you an example of just how tiny we're talking about, take a look at this. This is an alveoli, one of those little bubbles, those little air pockets. And right around the alveoli, we have a capillary which contains blood cells. And the capillary is so small that only one blood cell per time, and blood cells are really, really tiny, one blood cell per time can get through this capillary. So imagine how small this air bubble is if you can see these little tiny red blood cells right next to it. And these alveoli are covered, completely covered with all these little capillaries because we need to bring blood really, really close to the outside air because that's how we get oxygen into our body and that's how we get carbon dioxide out of the body. And the closer that we can get that blood to the air itself, the faster and the easier that gas exchange is going to happen. If we have a nice thick wall like through our skin, we get almost no gas exchange through our skin because it's so thick. It's really hard for that gas to get through there. So in the lungs, we create a nice safe space where we can bring that blood really, really close to that outside air and have that gas exchange happen actually very quickly. And notice how the thickness of this alveoli is only one cell thick, and the thickness of the capillary is only one cell thick. So the thickness, the difference between the blood cells itself and the outside air is only two cells thick. That's very, very close, and it lets that gas diffuse in and out of that bloodstream very easily. But despite how close that is and how much oxygen and carbon dioxide you're able to exchange, you still need a large surface area. You have a lot of blood that's circulating through your lungs all the time because it's got to feed your whole body. So if you add up the surface area of all of these alveoli, the inside surface area of all of the alveoli in your lungs, you're going to come up with a huge number, a number like 1,000 square feet. That's the surface area inside your lungs. That means if you took all your alveoli and flattened them out and spread them out across the floor, they would cover a surface the size of an average two-bedroom apartment. Okay, that's how much surface area there is inside the lungs. Because so much blood has to flow by in such a very tiny space, you need that much surface area to allow that gas exchange to happen as rapidly as we need to in order to burn the energy that we need to stay alive. Now notice just along the inside surface of the alveolus, we're showing this blue layer. This blue layer is a little water film layer, and that's what keeps those cells moisturized. And that's why our nose is so important because it humidifies the air that we breathe in. If we were to breathe in dry air and it gets into this area, that water film is very, very thin. And if that were to dry out, then the cells would start to dry out and they'd crack and they'd start to bleed and that would be a bad thing. So we need to keep this water film around it to keep those cells healthy 
but it has to be a very thin water film, again, because we want those cells as close to the air as possible. So there are some conditions where that water film thickens. And that water film, essentially what it is, it's basically plasma from the blood. Okay, there's little tiny gaps or little holes in the capillaries that allow some of that plasma out and it goes through the cells and it covers the surface of the alveolus. So what happens if we have really high blood pressure in our lungs? Now, yes, this is possible. You know, you know people have high blood pressure, okay? You take blood pressure on your arm and you can tell what your blood pressure is but it's possible to have different blood pressures at different places in the body. It's possible to have really high blood pressure in one part of the body and really low blood pressure in a different part of the body and different problems can cause that. So for example, if we had an issue with the heart, say, let's say the mitral valve, and we'll get to that in the next chapter, but if we had an issue there where we had really high blood pressure in the lungs, this is known as pulmonary hypertension, hypertension meaning high blood pressure, pulmonary meaning lungs. So if we had pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure in the lungs compared to the rest of the body, what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of high blood pressure in this capillary here. And that's going to force the plasma, force that water out through those holes and into the alveolus. Okay, so this blue film of water that you see here is going to get thicker and thicker because the water is going to be pushed out into the alveolus. And when that happens, suddenly the distance between the air and and the blood cells becomes greater, and the gas exchange is much, much slower. So just a little increase in that thickness of that water film can create a dramatic effect on how much gas exchange can happen. So pulmonary hypertension prevents oxygen from getting into the blood, and the patient starts to have trouble breathing, not moving the air in and out, but getting the oxygen into their blood, and that's a big problem. Another condition that can happen, this often happens with smokers, is that they can develop something called emphysema. Now, emphysema is a case where the little barriers between one alveolus and the next alveolus start to break down a little bit. Again, those walls are really, really thin, only just a few cells thick. And if you get any sort of irritation in there at all, those cells, those walls can break down and one alveolus sort of merges with the next and merges with the next and they become bigger and bigger. And you say, okay, well, no big deal. Except remember that surface area, that thousand square feet of surface area that we need to let that all that gas exchange happen? Well, if we break down these walls between these alveolus, the amount of surface area that we have suddenly drops. All right, you don't have all these little walls to act as additional surface area. So again, gas exchange in the lungs is going to be greatly reduced because we have a reduced surface area in patients with emphysema. Now, to understand how breathing works, we have to understand the diaphragm. The diaphragm is this giant sort of parachute-shaped muscle at the bottom of our rib cage that separates our thoracic cavity, where our lungs and heart are, from our abdominal cavity, which is where our liver and our spleen and our stomach and our intestines are. So we have this big muscle that separates these two cavities and is sealed off perfect, it's a perfect seal between these two cavities. And when we breathe in, we pull down on that diaphragm muscle, which pulls air into the chest cavity. So let's talk a little bit about how this breathing process works, because it's really kind of cool. And to do this, I'm sort of going to... There we go. Okay, I'm bigger now. Now I can do a little demonstration for you. All right, so take a look at this little model of the lungs and the chest cavity that I have here for you. Okay, I've got a little jar here, and it's got a tube and an opening at the top, and the tube goes down to two balloons, which represent the lungs, okay? And down here at the bottom, I have this yellow membrane. This is representing the diaphragm. And what's going to happen is as I move the diaphragm up and down, it's going to change the volume in this cup, which is going to create a vacuum. And as I pull the diaphragm down, it's going to create a vacuum in there pulling air in. And the only way the air can get in is through this little tube up here. And it's going to cause the lungs to inflate. Watch. Isn't that cool? As I pull down on the diaphragm, the lungs inflate. As I release the diaphragm, the lungs deflate, and the air is pushed in and out through that tube, filling, expanding, and then contracting the lungs.
Now, this isn't a great model, and normally in your chest cavity, there's not this extra air around the lungs. The lungs completely fill this chest cavity all the way out to the very edge of the walls of the chest cavity. So the lungs completely fill this space. There is no extra air in there, but the diaphragm still works the same way, and it fills the entire lung, this entire cavity, with air as it moves up and down. So here's a little trivia question for you that might seem a little unrelated, but we'll get to that. Why do we have ribs? You know, ribs that go around the chest cavity. Why do we have them? Well, everybody knows that ribs are there for protection. They protect the heart and the lungs, right? I mean, you see that on the internet. You hear it from your parents. You see it, everybody talks about it. Even ask your doctor. Your doctor will probably tell you, yeah, we have ribs because they protect the lungs and the heart. Nah, that's not right. Think about this. You do have bone that protects parts of your body. You have the skull, which is a solid bone that goes completely around and across the brain. It protects the brain. That's what its function is. All right. That makes sense. Ribs, though, they're not solid. It's not a solid wall of protection around your thoracic cavity, around your lungs and your heart. There are spaces. There's a rib and then a space and then a rib and then a space. All right. And the spaces are actually a little bit bigger than the ribs themselves. So you have maybe 50% coverage, maybe less than 50% coverage of your thoracic cavity covered by ribs. That's not really protection. Really? Think about it. If you go to the airport and you have the TSA, the security screening line, and half the people in the line have to go through the checkpoint and the other half of the people can just walk on by, do you feel protected? No, that's not protection. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe a little bit. I mean, ribs are tough to build. It takes a lot of work for your body to build ribs. But for 50% protection, it's not really worth it. So what do the ribs do? What's their real function? Well, let's go back to our model here. Again, we have the solid jar and we pull the diaphragm up and down and that's what makes the lungs expand and contract. But imagine if this solid shell that I have here, this plastic shell, imagine if this were soft. Okay, if this were a soft membrane here, and I pulled down on the diaphragm, created a vacuum inside, what would happen? The walls, the soft walls, would collapse in on the cells. The vacuum would pull those walls in. Rather than air being sucked in through this tiny little tube, all the walls would just collapse in on themselves. And then when you release, they would expand. And then when you breathe in again, it would contract. Or when you pull down on the diaphragm, it would collapse again. So if the walls of your thoracic cavity are collapsing, the lungs aren't expanding because the whole volume of the internal area is not changing. The whole idea is we're changing the volume of that thoracic cavity. And this is soft. That's not going to happen because as we pull down on the diaphragm, the walls are going to collapse in and the volume is going to stay the same, which means the lungs are never going to inflate. So what do the ribs really do? Well, the ribs are structural. Take a look at this. So here we have a large building that's being constructed and we have the, the metal beams coming up and they're going to hold the roof up. Now look at these beams. They kind of look like ribs. That's exactly right because what they're doing is they're providing structural support. They're holding the roof up. They're keeping the roof from collapsing just like your ribs keep the chest wall from collapsing in on itself. It's structural. It keeps the chest wall from collapsing every time you create that vacuum. And these beams here don't really offer a whole lot of protection. Okay, maybe if a, a little airplane came down and sort of landed, they might hold it up a little bit, but that's rare. That doesn't happen. What these beams do is they hold the roof in place. And it's the roof, it's the skin that offers the protection. So skin across the entire body offers protection. That's what it does. It protects all the organs inside. All the ribs do is hold that skin in place so that when you create a vacuum inside the thoracic cavity, the walls of the thoracic cavity don't collapse and it allows the lungs to expand. Now, the diaphragm is controlled by phrenic nerves. Get it? Diaphragm, phrenic, phram, phrenic. Okay, that's where it comes from. So phrenic nerves control the diaphragm. And the phrenic nerves are not quite cranial nerves. They're not one of the 12 cranial nerves that we've learned. But they are a spinal nerve, one of the spinal nerves. And they come out here from C3, 4, and 5 spinal nerves. They run down to the diaphragm. And that's what causes the diaphragm to contract and relax, contract and relax. And the diaphragm itself runs all the way down to the bottom of the rib cage, all the way to that last rib is where the diaphragm attaches to the chest wall.
Now, the diaphragm is not the only muscle that helps in breathing. It's the main one. It's the big one. But there are other muscles that are involved as well. There are intercostal muscles. These are muscles between the ribs that actually take the ribs and turn them in and out a little bit. And this is what causes your chest to expand and contract. So as those muscles contract, it turns the ribs out and it actually causes the volume of the chest cavity, the volume of the thoracic cavity to expand a little bit. So those muscles pull on those ribs and expand that chest cavity. And then as they relax, the chest cavity contracts again. And there are other muscles as well, muscles up here in the neck that pull the clavicle up. So there's lots of different muscles that go into breathing, but the diaphragm down at the bottom, that's the big one that does most of the work. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the lungs fill the entire thoracic cavity, other than where the heart and the trachea and things like that are, but basically any leftover space is filled by those lungs. And it's not so much that they're attached to the wall, the chest walls, that's not really how it happens. What happens is we create a vacuum inside the chest cavity that pulls the lungs open. That's what holds it open. It's not that there are attachments there, it's that we create a vacuum in there that pulls the lungs out, that pulls the lungs open. And we do that using something called the pleura. So surrounding the chest wall itself, on the inside we have the parietal pleura. Now pleura is just like peritoneum. It's that very thin, slippery, serous membrane that allows organs to slide against itself. And just like the organs in your abdominal cavity, there is a visceral peritoneum and a parietal peritoneum, and they slide against each other. Well, here in the chest cavity, we have a visceral pleura and a parietal pleura. Parietal meaning the outside wall, visceral or viscera meaning the inside, the organs themselves. So there's a pleura on the organ, the outside of the lung, and there's a pleura on the chest wall, and they're both very slippery and they slide against each other. And the key here is that there's no gap between them. There's no air between these two layers. So you have a perfect vacuum in this space. And that's what pulls the lung up. That's what pulls the surface of the lung out to the chest wall and holds it there. That perfect vacuum between the two layers of the pleura. So imagine what would happen if we got a puncture or something through the chest wall and we got air into this space between the two pleura. That's supposed to be a vacuum, a perfect vacuum. That's what's holding the lung out against the chest wall. If we get air in there, all of a sudden what's going to happen is the lung is going to collapse. There's no longer a vacuum holding it out and the lung is going to collapse. That's a collapsed lung and that's very bad for a patient. And the high class term for a collapsed lung is atelectasis. And you can see what that looks like in a chest x-ray here. Here you can see the top of the right lung appears to be almost missing. That's because this top lobe, this top of the three lobes, has collapsed. And I'll talk about how we can fix that in a moment. Where the ribs come together at the center of the chest, we have the sternum. And the sternum is the bone that's divided into three parts. And these three parts are important to know. The top part of the sternum is known as the manubrium. And it has clavicular notches on each side where the clavicle attaches to the sternum. And then it has this little jugular notch or suprasternal notch at the top of the manubrium. The body of the sternum is the main portion in the middle. And down at the bottom, you have this little extension known as the xiphoid process. When you're doing CPR, that's that point that you're looking for and feeling for as you do the chest compressions. There are three different types of ribs. The first seven ribs are known as true ribs only because the bone connects directly to the sternum itself. So those ribs come around, connect directly to the sternum. Three more ribs, ribs eight, nine, and 10 are known as false ribs because the ribs come around and then there's cartilage that sort of bends up and connects to the next piece of cartilage. So they don't quite connect directly to the sternum, but they almost do. And then down at the bottom, we have ribs 11 and 12, which are floating ribs, which just sort of hang there. They don't actually connect to anything. Within the thoracic cavity, within the chest cavity, inside the ribs, we have obviously the lungs and the heart is in there as well. But we also have a few other structures that we should talk about, and those are mostly contained in the mediastinum. That's the name of the central core of the thoracic cavity where all the tubes and things sort of run through. That's where the plumbing happens. So in the mediastinum, you can see here, we have the trachea that splits down into the bronchi. We have the esophagus running down the back to the stomach. We have a lot of major vessels, the aorta, the venous cava, both of them run through the mediastinum. And we have several nerves that run through this area as well, including the phrenic nerve that controls the diaphragm. 
And also in the mediastinum, but not shown in this graphic, is the thymus gland, which is an immune system gland that sits right behind the sternum. So let's take a look at some of the thoracic surgeries you might see. A bronchoscopy is an endoscope procedure where the endoscope is inserted down the trachea into the bronchi to look around inside the lungs. Sometimes the surgeon might want to take a biopsy of some of the tissue that they find in there, and there's usually a little attachment to the bronchoscope that can reach out and take a little biopsy. Or sometimes they might want to suction a little bit of the fluid that they find in there, and they're going to trap it in something called a Lucan's tube. Now what happens here is this Lucan's tube is attached to the regular suction that's attached to the wall suction, but what happens is as it sucks the air in, anything that comes with that air is going to be trapped in the bottom of this Lucan's tube, so it can be sent off to pathology before it's sucked into the regular vacuum container. But as the bronchi turn into bronchioles and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and they branch out more and more, you can imagine that finding your way through this whole network is going to be kind of challenging. So one cool thing that's now developed is something called bronchoscopy with navigation. Basically, it's like GPS for a bronchoscope, which is kind of cool. What they'll do is they'll take an image of the lungs first and create a map, a 3D map of all the bronchi and bronchioles, and then find out exactly where the place that we want to look for an issue is. And we're going to put that 3D navigation on the screen so the doctor knows, do I turn left? Do I turn up or down? Which way do I go when I come to each of these forks? And there are many, many forks as the bronchi become smaller and smaller and smaller. So bronchoscopes are really good at looking at the inside of the trachea and the bronchi, but what if we want to look at the outside of the trachea and the bronchi or any of the other items in the center of the chest cavity? Again, in the mediastinum, which is where all the plumbing of the chest goes. So we're going to do something called a mediastinoscopy. Now in this case, we're going to make a little incision right here, right above that jugular notch, right above that top notch in the manibrium, in the sternum, okay, that jugular notch, make an incision there, stick a scope, an endoscope, down into the mediastinum, into the thoracic cavity, but not into the lungs, not into the bronchi, and we're going to look at the outside of all of the plumbing in there. So here you can see the scope extended down, and we're looking at the outside of the trachea and the bronchioles. We can look at the outside of the aorta, the outside of the esophagus. We can look at the outside of some of the vena cava parts, and even the outside of parts of the heart, the pericardium. So we're able to see a lot of cool stuff using a mediastinoscope going in just above that jugular notch in the sternum. Now, just like in the abdomen, when we can do a minimally invasive procedure known as a laparoscopy, where we use a scope and a couple of little ports to put some instruments in, we can do the same thing for the thoracic cavity. Now, I personally would have called this something like a thoracoscopy or something like that, but they decided to get fancy. They're going to call this a video-assisted thoracic surgery, or VATS. So VATS is basically a laparoscopy, but for the chest, for the thoracic cavity. And a common VAT surgery that is done is the repair of blebs, pulmonary blebs. Now, to understand what blebs are, you have to understand, again, you have the air in the lungs, and then you have the visceral pleura that covers the surface of the lungs. And sometimes you can get a little breakdown of the lung tissue, and you can get a little bubble of air from the lungs get up under this visceral pleura. It creates this little bubble that you see here. But of course, the visceral pleura is this very thin layer of tissue. It's not very strong, and it's very easy for these little bubbles to pop. Now, why is that bad? Well, again, that's going to let air in between the visceral and parietal pleura, which is supposed to be a vacuum, okay? And if air gets in there from the inside of the lungs, then the lung is going to collapse. So whenever we see blebs such as this, we know that there's a high risk for a collapsed lung, so we want to go in there and repair this. Now to repair this, sometimes we can go in there and act sort of like it's a hernia, a little air hernia, if you will. We take the tissue and bring it together and sort of, you know, staple it back together and hopefully we seal it up. That's usually not too effective. So what we end up doing is something called a pleurodesis. Now, a pleurodesis is intentionally creating adhesions. Now, remember, in general surgery, we had adhesions where one organ would stick to another. There'd be a little scar tissue that would might form in between the two organs or between the organ and the abdominal wall. That would be an adhesion, that scar tissue that forms there. And we'd usually go in and cut that away because we don't want adhesions in the abdominal cavity. But if we have a series of blebs, if we have a lot of those, we might go in and intentionally create adhesions between the lungs 
and the chest wall. So we're going to create scar tissue. We're going to, you know, sort of scratch it up, maybe burn it up a little bit, just to create that scar tissue that's going to hold the lung onto the chest wall. Now remember what I said, we had parietal pleura and visceral pleura, and what holds the two together is the vacuum in the middle. But if we can't contain that vacuum anymore, what we can do is we can create adhesions that's going to attach the visceral pleura to the chest wall through this scar tissue, and that's going to hold the lung open. Okay, it's not going to be quite as comfortable. The lung's not going to be able to slide around, but you know what? Keeping that lung open and being able to breathe is probably more important than having the lung slide around a little bit. Now, vats can also be used to repair a condition called pectus excavatum. In this case, we're talking about a sunken chest where the sternum, which is usually out in, well in front of the chest, has actually sunken in, is pressed inward into the mediastinum area. And as you can imagine, that's going to cause a lot of problems. So to do this repair, we're going to use vats, video-assisted thoracic surgery, to find a clean path through from one side of the chest wall to the other, and we're going to insert a metal rod, a curved metal rod, through this space. And I have an, sort of an example of it here using this paper clip. So we're going to insert this metal rod through from one side to the other, through that little indentation where the chest wall is, and once we get it fed through and the ends exposed on each side of the chest wall, we're then going to take this rod and rotate it around like this, so it's now pushing up against the sternum and lifting that chest wall upward. We're going to then fix both ends of this into place into the chest wall, and this bar is going to hold the chest wall open. This NUS procedure is usually most effective on children five years or younger. A pulmonary thromboendartectomy. There's a big fun word. So what we're talking about here is a buildup of plaque in the blood vessels of the lungs. Now plaque, we're talking about atherosclerosis. You probably heard of that. That's the buildup of plaque that can happen in arteries around the body. And in this case, the plaque builds up in the pulmonary artery, the artery leading into the lungs. So this can cause blockages of that artery. And we have to go in and remove that plaque. And usually it comes out as this one large piece in many cases. So what we'll do is we'll go in, cut open that artery, and sort of scrape around and release that plaque from the walls of the artery and pull it out and then suture it back up, allowing the blood to flow through that artery much more easily. That's a pulmonary thromboendartectomy. A decortication of the lung is an interesting procedure, and it's usually a fairly long and delicate procedure. And what we're doing here is we're removing the visceral pleura of the lung. Now remember that pleura, that's that serous membrane that makes it nice and slippery. You have one on the parietal pleura, the side of the chest wall, one on the lung side as well, that's the visceral pleura. And what can happen is you can get diseases of the pleura. Now in this image here, I'm showing some cancer that has attacked the pleura of the lung. So we're gonna have to go in and remove that pleura to get all that cancer out of there. But it doesn't have to be cancer. Sometimes patients will have a condition called empyma. And in this case, you're going to have an abscess or some fluid that builds up in that pleural space. You know, where there's supposed to be a vacuum, you get some fluid that builds up in there. Maybe there's an inflammation or a little infection or something like that. And if this inflammation or infection goes on long enough, you can actually build up scar tissue in that area. So whenever you have any tissue damage, you're going to repair it with scar tissue. So even a little mosquito bite that you had when you were 10, you can look at your skin under a microscope when you're 80, and you're still going to find the scar tissue from that mosquito bite. It's still there. It hasn't replaced fully with skin. It's replaced with this fibrous, tough scar tissue to repair that wound. So if you have an inflammation in your pleura that continues to cause damage to the pleura, it's going to continually be repaired with scar tissue. So what's going to happen? Well, your pleura is going to become more and more thickened with scar tissue, this tough fibrous tissue. So, okay, why is that a big deal? Well, think about your lungs. Your lungs expand and contract and expand and contract as you breathe, right? So the pleura is real stretchy. At least normally it is. It's real stretchy, so it can expand and contract. But if the pleura becomes filled with this scar tissue, this fibrous, tough tissue that makes up scar tissue, then it's no longer going to be able to expand and contract. So you can sit there and breathe in all you want, but the lung is going to be trapped it's going to be stuck in this scar tissue and it's not going to be able to expand very well. 
So what we can do is whether we have cancer of the pleura or we just have this scar tissue that builds up around the pleura is we can go in and do a decortication of the lung where we're going to go in and remove the pleura or at least the scar tissue around the pleura and take it all the way around, strip it all the way around the lung and remove that tissue and suddenly the lung can expand again and contract just as it used to and the patient feels much better. But whenever we do any kind of surgery on the lungs, we have to go through the pleura in order to get there, unless we're doing a bronchoscope or something. But we otherwise, we have to go through the pleura. And that means we're going to create a hole. And that vacuum in there, in that space, is going to fill up with air. Every, as soon as we make that hole, there it goes. It's going to fill up with air, and the lung is going to collapse. That's just going to happen with these kinds of surgeries. So in order to repair a collapsed lung, to get rid of that vacuum between the two pleural spaces, we're going to use something called a pleurivac. And this is a system that's going to draw that air out of that pleural space slowly and gently so we don't damage the lungs. And it's going to draw that air out slowly, keeping the lung inflated, keeping that pleural space with a vacuum until it heals over. And the Pleurivac system is kind of a cool system that uses some channels and tubes of water and suction, and it allows you to very, very precisely control exactly how much suction is being applied. So you don't apply too much or too little when you connect it to wall suction, right? You can sort of can't control that real precisely. But with the Pleurivac system, you can control it very precisely. And even if there's some fluctuations in the wall suction system, the Pleurivac system is going to keep that suction at exactly the the right level that you want to keep that lung inflated. So if we do find cancer or growth in part of the lung, we're going to have to go in and remove that part of the lung. And depending on the size or the amount that we have to take out determines what kind of procedure we're going to do. And they're all different variations on the same thing. We could do a little wedge resection, which is just going to take out a little wedge of the lung, a little piece of the lung. We can do a segmental resection where we take out a segment of the lobe. We can do a lobectomy where we take out an entire lobe of the lung or even a pneumonectomy where we're going to take out all the lobes of that particular lung, the entire lung on that side. An instrument that's commonly used during a pneumonectomy is the serrat, which is kind of a, a curved, a large curved debakey uh, instrument of forcep that sort of pinches and grabs the tissue. But notice it has these tiny little barbs here that's going to help it hold on to that lung tissue as you retract it and pull it away. And finally, if there's severe enough damage to both lungs, we'll often have to do a lung transplant. That's where we're going to take a donor lung, place it into the patient, and then make all those connections in the hilomary. We're going to connect the bronchial together, the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins, and suture all them up, anastomose those tubes, so that the lung is able to then inflate and help the patient. So again, to me, this stuff is really cool. I enjoy talking about this. I hope I didn't bore you too much. And again, the next segment of this chapter, the cardiac part, is coming up next.